Long-time Otara resident Swanee Nelson first started the Pat- Pataka Kai movement last August, where she set up a pantry outside her house that anyone could donate or take food from it. That's now ballooned into 110 pantries across the country. But as Jessie Chang reports, the resident now has her sights on turning eating habits around. Decked out with fairy lights and a slick grass turf on the top, Swanee Nelson's Patakakai has come a long way since it first started out. It's still a humble little outdoor pantry, but it's come to mean so much more. I would never ever have imagined that would have happened in such a short space of time, but it what I tell people, it's quite bittersweet. It's bitter because it's reflected just how bad it's been for families and how how much communities are needing quicker and easier access to food. Um, and I guess on the sweet side, it's really brought communities together, neighbours together. But Ms Nelson says another problem still remains. What are people actually eating? So if you're very familiar with Otara and the town centre, it's very difficult to find good food, healthy food options. We really want to look at how we can improve access to good food, um, fresh fruit and vegetables, and also enable a space within the town centre that could act as that beacon of light with regards to health and wellbeing. The solution is creating their own not-for-profit nutritious eating village in the Otara town centre. A 40-foot container is being converted into what Swanee Nelson calls a micro-mart, where fresh produce, healthy food and coffee will be sold at low prices. They're partnering with different community groups to grow fruit and veggies to then supply to the hub. Any funds that do come back in through that space are going to be used to sustain the project and also create social outcomes. And those social outcomes will be determined by the community. It could be something as simple as running free cooking classes or um, teaching people how to use the urban garden. Swanee Nelson is also in the process of creating a new app called Kai Nation. The idea behind it is to allow people to share with others what food they have in real time. Ms Nelson says that will cut food waste and connect people with what they need. Mark Semiona from the Otara Health Charitable Trust says again and again people ask for more nutritious food choices. There's been a number of surveys done over and over again as to what they want to see and what the community is still saying is they want to see they want to see a, a, a supermarket here. They want to see something like pack and save, like countdown. They want to see good shops here in, in Otara. There are some options here but we also know that there's KFC coming here which absolutely doesn't help. The arrival of the fast food chain KFC in the area is a concern to social worker Rocky Masiapo. If you research and figure out the numbers in terms of how high the diabetes rates is in Otara, it's quite high. I mean, sometimes I sit in, all, in some of these um, health services when I'm not well and then I see a lot of people come in and, and getting their blood checked and things like that, dialysis, diabetes, and it's just adding more insult to injury, literally. Rocky Masiapo says there is a serious need for better food options. The community hope to have the Healthy Hub up and running by late this year. For Morning Report, Jessie Chang. 20 minutes to nine in Auckland this morning. There's been a crash at the intersection of Sandringham Road and Walters Road in Kingsland. It is causing delays for citybound traffic on Sandringham Road, so try to avoid the area if you possibly can. 19 to nine. And just a note, we are looking to take a press conference from Simon Bridges, the opposition leader, soon. We'll bring that to you as soon as it happens down at Parliament. Right, disability advocates aren't holding out much hope. Uh, Today's budget will deliver the wholesale changes they're hoping for. But at a conference at Te Papa, they heard about overseas projects designed to get disabled people into the community, build independence and actually save money in the long term. Catherine Hutton reports. Ralph Broad is the founder of the Local Area Coordination Network in England and Wales. Launched in 2010, it now operates in 14 counties and employs a person in each area who every month helps up to 200 people. The most powerful thing is can we come alongside people early? Can we help them to build their confidence, their connections, uh, their valued roles within community and with the community as well to help them to not need or to reduce their need for services. Cecily Colson is from Go Why Seattle, the NGO in Washington State which has helped get more than 80% of people with intellectual disabilities into work. Here the rate is around 15%. She told delegates she came from a place that believes anyone can work. So we all start from the same place, a place of scarcity. Yet we work on one piece of the 
cultural spectrum that allows us the most independence, and that's work. Once we get a job, what we like to say back home is, now I have multiplied my choices to be in the community. That's a dream scenario for advocates here. Garth Benny, who heads the Disability Support Network, says Washington's success is the result of year-on-year -year investment in staff, who are very good at getting people into jobs. They can create employment opportunities that employers didn't know they had for individuals that your typical employer would never ever have thought or considered as an employee. We don't invest in the workforce to anywhere near the extent that we need to. Dr Benny says today's budget is critical for the sector, but given the demands on funding, he's not expecting it to deliver a sustainable long-term solution. The Minister for Disability Issues, Carmel Cipollone, admits progress has been slow, but was tight-lipped about what might be in the budget, admitting the timing of her speech wasn't great. I actually should have said how about we do it on the 30th of May uh, in the afternoon when I would have been able to be a little bit more open about um, the government's plan for disabled people and the disability sector. Uh, so just excuse me if I'm a little bit vague today. Um, but I'm sure our government doesn't want to see any leaks. The conference finishes today. For Morning Report, call Catherine hudson -Tene. It's about 17 minutes to nine. The man who could be Britain's next Prime Minister has been summoned to court on charges of misconduct. In the run-up to the Brexit referendum, Boris Johnson claimed Britain gave the European Union £350 million a week. The figure was used by the pro-Brexit vote leave group uh, throughout uh, the referendum campaign on the side of that big red bus, uh, calling for the UK to fund our NHS instead. I spoke to our London correspondent Ollie Barrett a short time ago about this upcoming case. This is a private prosecution that has been uh, caught and the claim is that Boris Johnson committed misconduct in a public office uh, over claims that he made about funding going from the UK to the European Union. He repeated several times during the Brexit campaign ahead of the 2016 vote that Britain was paying the European Union £350 million a week, so a little under £700 million Kiwi dollars. Well, this private prosecution alleges that that figure was factually incorrect and that therefore he was uh, lying, therefore guilty of misconduct in public office. So that is the claim. Um, Boris Johnson's legal team deny that, but a district judge, a local judge, has agreed that this case can continue, which means Boris Johnson will have to attend a hearing at Westminster Magistrates Court, and then the case is likely to go further up the chain to Crown Court for a trial. Is he on shaky ground here? I mean, the statistics department has uh, questioned his claim, so is he, he in trouble here? The key here is that he's accused of uh, trotting out these figures when he was mayor of London. He will no doubt insist that these numbers were not far wide of the mark. In fact, some Brexiteers continue to insist that actually Britain, um, if you toss it all up in a slightly different way, contributes more than that. But the critics of Boris Johnson say that actually that number is just simply not true, that Britain gets a rebate from the European Union, so actually it contributes much less than that on a weekly basis. One of the critical points about all of this is that this legal legal process is undoubtedly going to take some time. We'll have this preliminary hearing at Westminster Magistrates Court at some point in the coming weeks. It'll then be referred up to the Crown Court. That could take several weeks more. And what that means is that Boris Johnson may well have uh, to make one or more court appearances at a time when he's running to become... Well, good morning. What we've seen this week is, I think, unprecedented and the most contemptible behaviour I've seen by a government. It shows a bungling incompetence, as I made clear yesterday morning. But it also shows how this government reacts under pressure. And that is deeply dishonestly and with smears on the opposition bringing in the police. It's quite clear, it shows, as I say, their incompetence. And what's so tragic and why I believe it was the right thing to do is because it's across all areas of government. We have more than just a, bud a budget that has been uh, botched. We have an economy that's significantly weakening. We have education with unprecedented strikes. We have health with fewer surgeries, we have roads not being built, we have houses not being built. 
But as I say, it's worse than that. It shows deep dishonesty. Treasury has known since Tuesday exactly what happened. And they covered it up to hide their incompetence. They have sat on a lie calling the National Party criminal hackers and calling in the police. We know this because with precision they made the changes that were necessary uh, on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, I've been told by sources within the Treasury, they knew they were sitting on the lie and they did nothing in relation to that. Today, I think we know the answer to my question, but if I hadn't called this press conference to reveal how we'd done this, would they still be sitting on the lie? Of course they would. They would be going through this budget knowing they were false, but with a position where they were alleging to New Zealanders there was a criminal hack by the New Zealand National Party, the opposition of New Zealand. And so I say the Secretary of the Treasury's position is clearly untenable. He must resign. But it's also been ministers who've been deeply dishonest. Grant Robertson, from the very start, has played politics in relation to this. He linked this quite clearly. briefed by his Treasury about exactly what was going on. In any event, the test rightly in New Zealand is that as a minister, he is responsible. He must resign. He does not have the moral authority to deliver the government's budget today. Winston Peters, the Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand, yesterday afternoon doubled down on the lie. He went out to the press gallery and he made quite clear in his words that he knew what happened, that it was illegal and that I needed to go. If the Deputy Prime Minister has any integrity, he should apologise publicly. I'm going to take you through exactly what it is that has happened. It's from within National. And by chance, in our preparation of the budget and for the budget, we came across this. We literally went to www.treasury.govt.nz. And as with every single government department website in New Zealand, if you go to the top, in this case, to the top right, here's the moment of truth. There's a search bar. And in the search bar, if you put, for example, 2019, 2020, and click that, the money in the budget came up for various votes. There was simply no need to click on anything else. And we want to give you a demonstration of precisely what happened uh, right now. Okay, can we just, just pause? Uh, we'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> on the website, putting in the 2019-2020 quote purchase of assets and searching and it starts to come up. Um, so he's a bit of a show and tell there with Yeah, this. doing a bit of a demonstration there with what uh, is possible to do some with tough the talking Treasury. Though today, some very tough talking from Simon Bridges. He's saying uh, that Grant Robertson should resign. 
that Winston Peters needs to apologise because he doubled down on it. And of course he's also said that the Treasury Secretary uh, should go as well. It is certainly uh, Simon Bridges uh, going for broke here. He feels very vindicated and is not backing away from this. And boy... What Indeed he's saying, you know, if he hadn't called the press conference this morning, would Treasury have sat on the lie? He's saying yes, they would. Could have done this if they had an interest in the budget. From your grandson to your grandma. And it's nothing more than New Zealanders do every single day of the week on Google or Trade Me. Gabrielle McClough, the Secretary for the Treasury, said that this was a bit like a room with a bolt, uh, with a key lock, where persistently people or actors had come in and tried to do in the bolt. Actually, what this is, is a room where people took the possessions from inside that room, room and put them on the street, street with a large sign that said, free to a good home. I repeat, what's happened this week is the most contemptible thing I've seen in New Zealand politics. The Secretary, Gabriel McClough, must resign, and Grant Robertson must also resign. Maybe take questions. Did um, Gabriel, talking about the, the bolt room example, did Gabriel McClough lie? I, I think he, by definition, must have been dishonest because it's very clear within Treasury on Tuesday uh, they knew uh, precisely what had happened. They did everything uh, right and ensured that we no longer could do just what we were doing, which was effectively a Google search. Did you do it 3,000 times? I, I don't know, but may well have. Reality is, there's a whole lot of people that do that on Trade Me every day. Was what it malicious to tenaciously exploit that hole so many times? I think it was our duty. It was the right thing to do. And the reason for that is, it shows the incompetence of this government, and it showed that this wellbeing budget is actually just glossy pictures what do you say to people who say even if you could access that information you shouldn't have? What's your response to them? The only wrongful behaviour we have seen is from the Treasury, Grant Robertson and other ministers such as Winston Peters. You knew how you did this straight away. You, you, Tuesday makes sense that you could have seen about yesterday morning. You, know you know the straw that broke the camel's back? was when the Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand came out and accused me of criminal behaviour. That was disgraceful. Wait, so you he he is the Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand, and he must have known, or if he didn't, he should have known what happened. Treasury has been sitting on this lie now for a couple of days, and so that's why I decided that I needed to come out and be really clear because they were sitting on a lie and, in fact, compounding it. So, so are you saying that you, you, saying that you wouldn't have actually come out and given this press conference to say how you got on if it wasn't for Winston Peters coming out yesterday and saying that you'd be gone burgers? That was a straw that broke the crack camel's back, but it was the behaviour of ministers. It was what Grant Robertson said, it was what the Prime Minister was saying, it was Butterwood and Mountain and Mouth, and it was Winston Peters who was actively being dishonest and smearing the National Party. Why aren't you calling on Winston Peters to resign then as well? Because arguably what he's done is the most, most egregious. No, no, I think the most egregious is Grant Robertson and the Treasury. Grant Robertson's a deeply political minister who has overseen this and is responsible for it. I believe he is quite clearly in his office donkey deep in it. Why but you? Winston Peters uh, has certainly, as I say, come out and doubled down on the lie. And for that, he must publicly apologise. Treasury says that they went to the police before the former minister about an hour before the former cabinet for consultation. Yeah, right. So you don't believe that? Yeah, right. Are you telling me Grant Robertson wasn't advised or his office wasn't advised? That beggars belief. Did you come down in the last show? I didn't. On Tuesday, you were saying you were nervous about revealing how this played out because you wanted to protect your source. Are you still nervous of that? I, I don't reveal the source. Uh, what I've told you is quite clear. This is from within National. I'm the leader of National. I take full responsibility for this. 
We've done our duty here by making clear to New Zealanders their incompetence uh, and by also uh, ensuring that this wellbeing budget is seen for what it is, that it ain't a wellbeing budget. And I'll say again, what we did is what any Kiwi any day of the week is doing on Google or Trade. What was the public interest though in dragging out this reveal over three days? What was the public interest in Treasury covering this lie up over a series of things, calling in the police on the New Zealand opposition? What was the public interest in Grant Robertson smearing the National Party? Because that's the only, you can dance on the head of a pin. But that is the only meaning you can give his statement. What was the public interest in the Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand um, saying and doubling down on complete falsehoods uh, to smear the opposition of New Zealand? This is the most contemptible behaviour I've seen in New Zealand politics. The public interest is quite clear, and I've now said it a number of times. No, no, I've got an answer. It was in relation to the uh, lack of competence by this government, which we absolutely have a duty to display to New Zealanders, and it was in relation to a wellbeing budget where on the numbers we have show it as anything but that. But it's glossy picks and it's spin, but it is a wellbeing budget. But that's public interest in releasing the information, not, a couple more not holding off on how you've actually obtained it for three days. What, what, what served the public in, in waiting so long for this to come out? I've explained that quite clearly. Yeah, well, I actually did. What I said was that um, the straw that broke the camel's back was Winston Peters, the Deputy Prime Minister, coming out with falsehoods. Uh, and that uh, made me think that actually we needed to do on the reflection the thing here was just to tell you. Okay. 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 Three IP addresses, all national party IP addresses, and were you tipped off in any way that there was this vulnerability with the site? Certainly not tipped up. As I say, literally stumbled across, across this, preparing for the New Zealand budget and going through old votes and appropriations to determine you know, what the changes uh, may be. In relation to the ISP addresses, I genuinely don't know, but I, I believe they probably are. Didn't Did you try to the National's name earlier? You had the evidence, no. you had the serious no. allegations. Why drag it out? No, not at all, because as I say, I, I think it's right actually to protect information and not to go through that. But what happened is we saw a series of things from the government. We're on reflection, I decided it's the right thing to do, and I'm doing it. Okay, so far is, did the of a simple website search. If you put, for example, 2019, 2020 and click that, the money in the budget came up for various votes. There was simply no need to click on anything else. Simon Bridges. The police